Well, I'll, I'll read the last, the whole of the last chapter, which is a, one of the shorter ones. Uh, ch- chapter 44. In it, the, the character of Lanark has been sent to a kind of major international conference. He's been given the title the Provost of Lanark in order to speak out for it, since there's a, a chance of it being one of the parts of the world that's going to be undermined or destroyed by the remaining parts. Anyway, it's, uh, uh, without going into it, the, the point is he's being conducted for a private interview with with this Lord Monbodo, who's supposed to be the in charge of everything. Chapter 44, The End As they crossed the dim, wide floor, Wilkins said cheerily, That was great fun. You scared the shits out of old M. The other man said, These intellectuals have no staying power. Lanark has been around for a long, long time, said Wilkins. I think he deserves a three-syllable name, don't you? Oh, he certainly deserves it, said the other man. There's nothing wrong with a two-syllable name. I'm called Uxbridge. But Lanark has earned something more melodious, like Blair Dardy. Rutherglen, Gerskadden, said Wilkins. Gorgonach, Carmonach, Ochenshugel, said the other man. Ochenshugel has four syllables, said Wilkins. They went through a narrow door, climbed a dingy stair, and crossed a small office into a slightly larger office. It was lit by an eon tube, and the walls were hidden by metal filing cabinets, some piled on others. There was a metal desk in the corner. Without much surprise, Lanark saw Monbodo sitting behind it, with hands clasped patiently on the waistcoat over his stomach. By location, said Monbodo, I would be nothing if I did not duplicate. Sit down. Wilkins placed a straight wooden chair before the desk, and Lanark sat. Wilkins, Uxbridge, go away. A Miss Thing will record us, said Monbodo. Lanark saw a girl exactly like Miss Maheen sitting between two filing cabinets. Wilkins and Uxbridge left. Monbodo tilted his chair back, looked at the ceiling and sighed. He said, At last the common man confronts the powerful lord of the world, except you are not very common and I am not very powerful. We can change nothing, you and I, but talk to me, talk to me. I am here to speak for the people of Unthank. Yes, you wish to tell me they have too few jobs and homes and social services, so stupidity, cruelty, disease and crime are increasing among them. I know that. There are many such places in the world, and soon there will be more. Governments cannot help them much. Yet governments can fire great structures into space. Yes, it is profitable. For whom? Why can't wealth be used to help people here and now? It is, but we can only help people by giving less than we take away from them. We enlarge the oasis by increasing the desert. That is the science of time and housekeeping. Some call it economics. Are you telling me that men lack the decency and skill to be good to each other? Not at all. Men have always possessed that decency and skill. In small isolated societies, they've even practiced it. But it is a sad fact of human nature that in large numbers we can only organize against each other. You're a liar, cried Lanark. We have no nature. Our nations are not built instinctively by our bodies, like beehives. They are works of art, like ships, carpets, and gardens. The possible shapes of them are endless. It's bad habits, not bad nature, that make us repeat the dull old shapes of poverty and war. Only greedy people who profit by these things believe they are natural. Your flood of language is delicious, said Ozenfant, yawning slightly, and can have no possible effect upon human behaviour. By the way, it was not clever of you to get Multan speaking for you. He is no enemy of the Council. 
He is a weak member plotting to become strong. If he succeeds, his aim will be my aim, to manage things as smoothly as possible. His only enemies will be people like you, the babies. I am not a baby. You are. Your deafness to reason and argument, your indifference to, to decent custom and personal dignity, a selfishness so huge and instinctive that it cannot even notice itself, all make you the neatest thing to an adult baby I have ever encountered. And now you may retaliate by calling me as many foul names as you please. Nobody will know. This thing cannot hear what is irrelevant to the business of the council. Lanark said coldly, You want me to lose my temper? Yes, indeed, said Monbodo, nodding, but only to cut short a useless argument. You suffer from the oldest delusion in, the, in politics. You think you can change the world by talking to a leader. Leaders are the effects, not the causes of changes. I, I, I cannot give prosperity to people whom my rich supporters cannot exploit. Lanark put his elbows on his knees and propped his face between his hands. After a while he said, I don't care what happens to most people. All of us over eighteen have been warped into deserving what happens to us. But if your reason shows that civilization can only continue by damaging the brains and hearts of most children, then your reason and civilization are false and will destroy themselves. Perhaps, said Monbodo, yawning, but I think we can make them last our time. What have you recorded, Miss Thing? Tell us, please. The secretary parted her lips and a monotonous voice slid out between them. Greater unthank addendum to General Assembly minutes. Provost Lanark referred to unthank serious employment, housing, health and pollution problems. Chairman Monbodo related them to the supernational crisis in these areas and intimated that the solution of such problems must await the primary solution of the worldwide energy famine. Provost Lanark called for a more urgent approach to local difficulties insofar as they affect the 10 to 18 spectrum. Chairman Monbodo suggested the outcome of difficulties in the spectrum was less disastrous than Provost Lanark feared. Miss Thing's mouth clicked shut. Monbodo slapped his brow and said, Kryptonite! I forgot the kryptonite deposits. I put them in Miss Thing. It will let us end on a cheerful note. Miss Thing opened her mouth again. Chairman Monbodo suggested the outcome of the difficulties in the spectrum would be less disastrous socially than Provost Lanark feared, as the development by Cortexin of the unthank mineral resources was well on the way to putting prosperity within the grasp of everyone. Lanark stood up and wrung his hands. He cried out, I am useless. I should never have come here. I did no good to anyone, not to Sandy, Rima, or anyone. I need to go home. Home? said Monbodo, raising an eyebrow. Underthank. It may be bad, but the badness is obvious, not gilded with lies like here. You are severe, but I will, I will help you. Open the bolt hole, Miss Thing. There was a grey wooden rug in front of the desk. Miss Thing knelt and pulled it back, uncovering a round steel plate sunk in the linoleum. She put a thumb and forefinger into two small openings at the centre and lifted it easily out, though it was two feet across and four inches thick. The way home, said Monbodo, look inside. You will recognise the interior of a familiar aircraft. He stood up and rested, hands in pockets, on the corner of the desk. Lanark stood and stared for a long time into the round hole. There was a cavity under it lined with blue silk. Monbodo said, You do not trust me, but you will climb inside because you are too reckless to linger, am I right? You're wrong, said Lanark, sighing. I will climb inside because I am too tired to linger. 
He stepped into the cavity, sat down and straightened his legs. The space lengthened and narrowed to fit him. He lay staring up at a circle of cream-coloured ceiling surrounded by blackness. He had heard Don Bodo murmur, Bon voyage, and a round black shade slid sideways across the circle of ceiling and eclipsed it with a low clang. Then the space he lay in dropped. The drop was a long, drown, rushing swoop, stopped by a jarring jerk. Then came another drop. With an indrawn scream, I knew he was going down the great gullet again. The tiny office, the great round table, Proven Great Runthank, Alexander Cathedral Rimmer Zone, Council Collagen's Institute, had been a brief rest from the horror of endless falling. Monbodo had tricked him back into it. He screamed with hatred. He pissed with panic. He writhed and his face came out into a rush of milky mist. He was plunging downward in the bird machine. The panic changed. He was the mind of this bird, an old bird in poor repair. Each wing stroke tore out feathers he needed for landing, and the land was far below. He kept falling as far as he dared, then levelling in a thrash of pinions, which thinned and flew back like darts. His bald breast and sides were freezing in the fall. The misty air thinned to black, and the black map of a city lay below, the streets dotted lines of light. Bits of the map were on fire. A big red flower of flame drew him down to it. He saw a flaming glass tower, a square of statues, engines and seething heads. He heard roaring and sirens, tried to level and crashed sideways on cracking wings through sparks, heat and choking smoke, where a great dim column swung at him. Mist swung away and swung back, like a mace to strike him down. He woke, sore and bandaged, in bed with a tube running into his arm. He lay there dreaming and dozing, and hardly thinking at all. He assumed he was in the Institute again, but the ward had windows with darkness outside them, and the beds were packed together with hardly a foot of space between. The patients were all very old. All cleaning and some nursing was done by those fit enough to walk, but there was a very small staff. The light fittings were peculiar. Electric globes hung from the ceiling by slim rods, which were parallel to each other, but slanted towards a corner of the ward. When a nurse took the tube from his arm and changed the bandages, he said, Is the hospital sloping? So you have found your tongue at last. Is the hospital sloping? And that was all we'd been laughing. The meals were mainly beans, and this pleased him, though he couldn't remember why. The doctor was a hurried, haggard, unshaven man in a dirty smock. He said, Have you any friends, old man? I used to have. Where can we contact them? They, they used to hang around the cathedral. Were you one of Smollett's mob? I, I knew Richie Smollett, yes. I knew Sludden, too. Best not to mention that. Sludden is far from popular at present. But you'll find if Smollett can take you. We have to evacuate this place. There's going to be another shock. What's your name? Lanark. A common name in these parts. We'd a provost called that once. He wasn't much good. Lanark slept and wakened to screams and shouting. He was sweating and sticky. The air was very hot and the ward empty, except for a bed in a far corner. An old woman sat in it, crying, They shouldn't leave us here, it isn't right. A soldier came in, looking carefully round. He avoided the old man's eye and edged towards Lanark between the empty beds. He was a tall man with a sullen, hard, handsome, slightly babyish face, and did not seem to be carrying a weapon. 
His only insignia was a badge on his berry, shaped like a hand with an eye in the palm. He stood looking down at Lanark, then sat on the edge of the bed and said after a moment, Hello, Dad. Lanark whispered, Sandy, and smiled and touched his hand. He felt very happy. The soldier said, We've got to get out of here. The foundation is cracked. He opened the bedside locker and took out trousers, jacket and shoes, and helped Lanark into them, saying, I wish you'd kept in touch with us. I didn't know how. You could have written or phoned. I never seemed to have time. Yet it did no good, Sandy. I changed nothing. Of course you changed nothing. The world is only improved by people who do ordinary jobs and refuse to be bullied. Nobody can persuade owners to share with makers when makers won't shift for themselves. I could never understand politics. How do you live, Sandy? A report for movers and menders. What kind of work is that? We have to hurry, Dad. Are you able to stand? Lanark managed to stand, though his knees trembled. The old woman in the corner bed wailed. Son, could you help me too, son? Wait here, help is coming, shouted Alexander fiercely. He took Lanark's right arm over his shoulder, gripped him round the waist, and moved him toward the door, cursing below his breath. They were labouring uphill, for the slope of the floor was against them. The screams and yelling grew louder. Alexander halted and said, Listen, he used to be a sentimental man in some ways, so shut your eyes when you get out of here. Some things are happening which we just can't help. Anything you say, son, said Lanark, closing his eyes. The arm round his waist gave him a strong feeling of happiness and safety, so strong a feeling that he started chuckling. He was helped down many stairs amid loud crying and across a space where his ankles brushed past fingertips, and then, though the air was no cooler, an uproar of voices and running feet suggested they were outside. He opened his eyes. The light threw him off balance, and he lost more balance trying to recover it. Alexander held him up, saying, Steady, Dad. A great loose crowd, much of it children shepherded by women, slid and stumbled down a hillside towards a wide open gate. But the hillside was a city square. The slanting lamp standards lighting the scene, the slanting buildings on each side, the slanting spire of the nearby cathedral showed the whole landscape was tilted like a board. What happened? cried Lanark. Subsidence, said Alexander, carrying him with the crowd. There's going to be another soon, a bad one. Hurry. Whenever Lanark's feet touched the ground, he felt a vibration like a continuous electric shock. It seemed to strengthen his legs. He began moving almost brisk briskly, chuckling and saying, I like this. Jesus Christ, muttered Alexander. Do I sound senile, Sandy? I'm not. This gate leads to the graveyard, the necropolis, doesn't it? We'll be safer away from the buildings. I know this graveyard well, Sandy. So did your mother. I could tell you a lot about it. This bridge we're coming to, for instance, had a tributary of the river flowing under it once. Shut up and keep moving, Dad. In the dim cemetery, people crouched in the grassy plots or dispersed up many little paths. From the height of the hill, a loudspeaker was telling people to keep near of the high monuments. Alexander said, Rimmer should be up at the top. Can you go on? Oh, yes, said Lanark excitedly. Yes, we must all get up there to the top. There's going to be a flood, a huge, immense deluge. Don't be stupid, Dad. I'm not stupid. Someone told me everything would end in a, in a deluge. He was very definite about it. Yes, we must go as high as possible, if only for the view. As they climbed the steep little paths, Lanark felt more and more energetic and cheerful. He tried to skip a little. 
Are you married, Sandy? Steady, Dad. I wish you'd call me by my full name. No, I'm not married. I've a daughter, if that's any consolation. It is. It is. Will she be at the top of the hill, too? No, she's in a safer place than this, thank goodness. Do you hear the guns? There was a distant snapping sound. How can men fight like that at a time like this? said Lanark, his voice squeaky with indignation. The Corquantal Galaxy are trying to liquidate their unthanked plant, but makers, movers and menders back defence command and supporting the one wagers against them. So the Council Rump have sent in the cocky grues. I understand none of that. What are cocky grues? I'll tell you when there's time. Buildings burned in the city below. The glossy walls of the tower blocks reflected flickering glares upon a small knot of people between the monuments and the summit. Lanner couldn't see them clearly because tears came to his eyes. It struck him that Rimmer must be an old woman now, and the thought was an unexpected pain. He muttered, must sit, and settled on the edge of a granite slab. The vibration through it irritated his backside. He made out a nearby knot of men wearing armbands and stooping over an old-fashioned radio transmitter. Beside them a stout woman in a black dress waved to Alexander, then came over and laid a hand on Lanark's shoulder. He gazed up astonished into her, her large-eyed, large-nosed face with small, bright, serious mouth. Though a little weary, and the glossy hair slightly streaked with grey, this seemed exactly the face he had first seen in the elite cafe. He said, You aren't Rimmer. She laughed and said, You always found it hard to recognise me. You've grown old, Lanark, but I knew you at once. Lanark smiled and said, You've grown fat. She's pregnant, said Alexandra glumly, at her age. You don't know my age, said Rima sharply and added. I'm sorry I can't introduce you to Horace Lanark, but he refuses to meet you. He's an idiot sometimes. Who is Horace? Alexander said sourly. Someone who doesn't want to meet you. And a rotten wireless operator. Lanark stood up. The vibration on the ground had become a, a strong, almost audible throbbing. And Rima said tensely, I'm frightened, Alec. Don't be nasty to me. The throwing stopped. In a great quietness, the hot air seemed to scald the skin. Lanark felt so heavy that he crashed on his knees to the ground, then so light that he rose in the air. When he came down again, the ground was not where he expected. He lay listening to tumbling and shouting and looked at the firelit pinnacle of an obelisk. It leaned so far over him that he knew it must crack or topple. He got heavy, then light again, and this time only his head left the ground and fell back again with a thump which dazed him slightly. When he next saw the obelisk, it pointed perfectly upright, and the glow in it was very strong. Tell me what's happening, please, said Rima. She lay curled on the ground, with her hands over her eyes. Everybody lay on the ground except Alexander, who knelt beside the radio transmitter, earnestly turning knobs. The ground is level again, said Lanark, getting up, and the fire is spreading. Is it horrible? It's wonderful. It's universal. You should look. Behind the burning building was a great band of ruddy light, with clouds rising into it, from collapsed and collapsing roofs. There were no other lights. First the fire, then the flood, said Lanark exultingly. Well, I've had an interesting life. You're as selfish as ever, shrieked Rimmer. Be quiet, I'm trying to contact Defence Command, uh, said Alexander. Nothing can be defended now. I hear the water coming, said Lanark. There was a far away rushing mingled with faint squeals. He subsided between two monuments to the edge of a slope and gazed eagerly down, holding himself erect by a branch of a twisty thorn tree. 
A blast of cold wind freshened the air. The rushing grew to surges and gurglings, and up the low road between Necropolis and the Cathedral swept a white foam, followed by ripples and plunging waves with gulls swooping and crying over them. He laughed aloud, following the flood with his miner's eye, back to the river it flowed from, a full river widening to the ocean. His cheek was touched by something moving, by something moving in the wind, a black twig with pointed little pink and grey-green buds. The colours of things seemed to be brightening, although the fiery light over the roofs had paled to silver, streaked with delicate rose. A long silver line marked the horizon. Dim roofs tops against it grew solid in the increasing light. The broken buildings were fewer than he had thought. Beyond them, a long, faint bank of cloud became clear hills, not walling the city in, but receding edge behind pearly grey edge of farmland and woodland, gently rising to a faraway ridge of moor. The darkness overhead shifted and broke in the wind, becoming clouds with blue air between. He leaped sideways and saw the sun coming up golden behind a laurel bush. Light blinking, space dancing among the shifting leaves, drunk with spaciousness, he turned every way, gazing with wide open mouth and eyes as light created colours, clouds, distances and solid, graspable things close at hand. Among all this light, the flaming buildings seemed small blazes which would soon burn out. With only mild disappointment, he saw the flood ebbing, ebbing back down the slope of the road. Rumour came beside him and said teasingly, Wrong again, Lanark. He nodded and sighed and said, Rumour, did you ever love me? She laughed, held him and kissed his cheek. She said, Of course I did, even though you kept driving me away so nastily and so often. They've started shooting again. They stood while listening to the snapping and crackings. She said, Defence Command have called Alexander over to maintenance. It's very urgent, but he says he'll come back for you as soon as he can. You're to stay here and not worry if he's late. Good. I'm sorry you can't come with me, but Horace is an idiot sometimes. Why should a young man like him be jealous of you? I don't know. She laughed, kissed his cheek and went away. After a while he hobbled back to the space between the monuments and sat once again on the edge of the granite slab. He was tired and chilly but perfectly content to wait. There was nobody about but after a while he heard the crunch of a foot on gravel. A figure approached him wearing the black and white clothes and carrying the silver-dipped staff of a chamberlain. Lanark had trouble focusing on the face under the wig. Sometimes it seemed to be Munro, sometimes Gloopy. He said, Munro? Gloopy? Correct, sir, said the figure, bowing respectfully. We have been sent to bestow on you an extraordinary privilege. Who sent you, said Lanark peevishly, institute or council? I dislike both. Knowledge and government are dissolving. I now represent the Ministry of Earth. Everything keeps getting renamed. I've stopped caring. Don't try to explain. The figure bowed again and said, You will die tomorrow at seven minutes after noon. The words were almost drowned by a squawking gull turning in the sky overhead, but Lanark understood them perfectly. Like a mother's fall in a narrow lobby, like a policeman's hand on his shoulder, he knew nor expected this all his life. A roaring like a terrified crowd filled his ears. He whispered, Death is not a privilege. The privilege is knowing when. But I... I seem to remember passing through several deaths. They were rehearsals. After the next death, nothing personal will remain of you. Will it hurt? Not much. 
Just now there is no feeling in your left arm. You can't move it. In a moment it will get better again, but in five minutes after noon tomorrow your whole body will become like that. For two minutes you will be able to see and think, but not move or speak. That will be the worst time. You will be dead when it's stopped. Lanark scowled with self-pity and annoyance. The Chamberlain said respectfully, Have you a complaint? I ought to have more love before I die. I have not had enough. And that is everyone's complaint. You can appeal against the death sentence if you have something better to do. If you're hinting that I should go in for more adventures, no thank you. I don't want them. But how will my son, how will the world manage when I am not here? The Chamberlain shrugged and spread his hands. Well, go away, go away, said Lanark more kindly. You can tell the earth I would have preferred a less common end, like being struck by lightning, but I'm prepared to take death as it comes. The Chamberlain vanished. Lanark forgot him, propped his chin on his hands and sat a long time, watching the moving clouds. He was a slightly worried, ordinary old man, but glad to see the light in the sky. Final little poem. I started making maps when I was small, showing place, resources, where the enemy and where love lay. I did not know time adds to land. Events drift continually down, effacing landmarks, raising the level like snow. I have grown up. My maps are out of date. The land lies over me now. I cannot move. It is time to go. Goodbye.